class is the UV system analysis class. It used to be just known as a uh, performance evaluation and tuning class, but the title was changed a couple years ago when we introduced the UV version of the class. I had seen one of you sign up for an Altex APEC class coming up. We'll have to talk about that later. <clears throat> uh, I'm hoping that you've got some basic Linux background. Again, I'm not in the same room with you to be able to uh, help you with some basic Linux type of stuff, but don't be afraid to send me email in any areas that you need uh, help on. The time zone difference will make it a little difficult to respond to email right away particularly in your morning, but be able to understand basic bash shell command line stuff. There is a uh, Linux system admin class that, that's kind of helpful, but again, uh, just knowing basic Linux. We don't really have any RPMs. Actually, there will be some RPMs that you're going to have to install during the week. I built the systems over the weekend. I gave them a vanilla RPM list, but I did not add additional RPMs. So it's just a basic install. Additional RPMs will have to be loaded with zipper. Repositories have been added, and also it's been registered and updates have been done. Trying to run the latest software, pre-release foundation, pre-release SGI performance suite, and the latest updates from Novell. We're also going to need you to be able to uh, boot and shut down the system and get to the serial console. Again, if there's a weak area, you just got to bring it up and we can demonstrate it. Know some basic Unix, be able to use P CD, PWD, LS, VI, things of that sort. There isn't really much in this class on disk partitioning or the volume manager. That's really part of the uh, advanced sysadmin class that I see a couple of you signed up for in a couple of weeks. And also helpful is being able to have a little bit of experience with your particular system and what its workload looks like. Objectives. Main thing I'm going to try to be doing all week is describe the steps to tune a system. Frankly, I don't care if this is a UV, an XE, an ICE, or even another vendor or operating system. The methodology is still the same. When I'm on Unix-based systems and Linux, I have something called SAR, System Activity Report. We are going to use that quite a bit during the next week. SAR will tell me how busy my CPU, memory, and disk drives are. And there is a graphical interface to the system activity data called Performance Copilot that I will use quite a bit during the week. In particular, PM chart that I'm going to have uh, both on the UVs and I have it installed on my Windows desktop. There is something called CSA accounting. I'm probably not going to really cover that much. It's not supported anymore, but I am going to use it during the week. I don't want to spend any time on it. Instead, what we're going to be spending time on is PBS accounting data. And I need to get jobs running under PBS this week and start looking at service times, QA times, things of that sort. From there, you got to figure out what performance metrics are of interest. Depending upon your site and the workload characteristics, you have different quality of service metrics. For example, in the database market, I care about transactions per second. Video market, uh, video frames per second, things of that sort. From there, one of the key things I want to be able to do is identify common tuning problems, determine an objective, and talk about solutions. In particular, this is a two-week class, really. The second week, the UV Advances Admin class gets into memory and I.O. And in this first week, we get into the user CPU time and start resolving user and application CPU time issues, both user and system time. This is not an application tuning class, but this is a class for administrators to work with application programmers. I'm going to be giving you some codes, and we want to find, uh, in particular, there is a code 2 that we want to find the hotline numbers in the program and find uh, non-productive CPU time within that program. Now, we're going to start off with single CPU, 
Then we're going to go to multi-threading situations and discuss OpenMP and MPI. In particular, we're just covering the SGI's MPI, known as MPT. We are not covering Intel MPI or other flavors of MPI in this class at this time. <clears throat> I'm also going to introduce and have some memory issues and talk about the process memory map, talk about the shared text, the data, the stack segments, things of that sort. I intend to put the system through problems all week. So even today, there is a workload running on the system that I do want to take a look at. And during the week, I do hope to deadlock the system, hang the system, panic the system, do whatever I can to make a mess of the system. Sometimes it's controlled and planned, and sometimes it isn't. One reason I'm running the latest software and a pre-release uh, latest kernel that I need to talk about as well. And lastly, talk about resolving your CPU affinity issues and getting into CPU sets and D-place and memory placement, too, with NUMA CTL. Everything about tuning these systems is to lock things down to a processor, to a socket, lock it down to a particular core, uh, core on a processor, and keep everything else away from it and stay on the same core all the time. Privatize it with CPU sets and pin it down with D-Place and NUMA CTL. Is that Mike? Sorry, yes. I heard you join. Yeah. We're just getting started, so are you able to find materials? Yeah, I'm on the WebEx now. Okay. Jump in, let me know if you need anything. Okay. Send me email if you need anything. Again, because of the time schedule, the plan is that I deliver the lecture. <clears throat> and I, you know, it's going to be into the day. And uh, Mike, the two other attendees are coming out of India, so they're yeah. in a work. Okay. Too. Okay. Yeah, sure. So just jump in and let me know if there's anything. I may not be awake at the time in your morning when you're working on labs individually, but send me email at any time on anything. Sure or not. So course schedule. Again, I, I always have trouble finding a balance between lectures on slides, the demos, and then getting you to lab. I have quite a bit. Uh, <coughs> I don't know, Mike, did you get a DVD mailed to you? I did, yes. Okay. So I pointed you to my web page, and that's basically recordings of prior classes. Don't expect them to match the most current hardware, software, or manual. But if I had a class three years ago and something went nice, something was interesting about it, it's still a useful recording. And on that uh, DVD, I've put basically everything that I've got. I simply ask that it not be posted on the web and made available blindly, that copyright be respected. I don't mind if it is shared as long as it's just not posted on the web and made available to anybody. So the basic schedule, uh, I'm not very good at a 45-minute lecture and then a 15-minute break, but that's what I try to do is uh, basically four one-hour shots during the day. I'm not planning on taking a lunch break. And again, you're kind of in the evening for both of you. So, or uh, Mike, you're in the afternoon. But uh, I'm just going to go straight through the lecture and demo portion of the material and then let you get back to whatever projects and work you have. I do hope that you do try to replicate things and take advantage of the systems. And Mike, I believe I gave you Floyd 1. Okay. Sorry, Floyd 1. Yeah, Floyd 1 would be your system to do root type of stuff on. Okay, fine. So if, if the way I run the class is Floyd 3 is a bigger system, and I will be doing demos and stuff like that on Floyd 3. But when you go into dedicated lab, it might require things that are root-oriented. I can't have each of you doing a root configuration on the same machine at the same time. So basically, Mike, you have Floyd 1 to, uh, you know, 
install something to uh, create problems, load problems, things of that sort. And again, Mike, I freshly installed everything over the weekend with the latest software, including a, a uh, pre-release kernel from Hetty that is resolving a uh, trim problem in memory that I want to take a look at during the week. Any questions? So my basic layout or schedule today is overview, kind of get oriented. I want you to be able to get into your system. We're going through an introduction right now, and I want to talk about methodologies. And again, I don't care whether I'm looking at a uh, titanium system, an x86 system, an ice cluster. When I do an ice tuning class, I put it through this class. So the concepts are pretty generic in the class, except for the fact that I have Numalink here instead of InfiniBand or some other sort of interconnect. First thing I got to do when I get into a system is do an inventory and figure out what do I have. So sometime during the day or before we start tomorrow morning, I want each of you to have logged into your Floyd and figured out what kind of system you have. Unfortunately, I do not have RAID for every no every uh, partition that I have here. In fact, I would need more blades. To be, I've got a two-blade system. I would need more blades to put uh, PCI into my system. So I've only got one system with one PCI card that's going to my RAID device. I also have an NFS home directory coming off of a, another system as well that we'll take a look at. So first thing i got to figure out is what do I have for a system? What's my inventory? Also, I want to be able to instrument the system and be able to get tools installed, and in particular in this module, getting SAR and Performance Copilot installed and working. Also in the past, and I'll just mention this since Mike just joined us, uh, comprehensive system accounting, no longer integrated, supported, and released by SGI, but I do still use it. But I'm not going to assign labs for CSA accounting unless it's something that you do use at sites. And I'm also, depending upon the time frame today, talk about some basic metrics. So basic um, ob objective today is an overview. And in particular, being able to get a methodology in how to approach a system. I do always like to kind of introduce things the first day and then come back through it the second day. So I do hope to be able to get in and actually start looking at the Floyds to see what they're doing. Second day, tomorrow, will be mostly analysis. I want to do a little, little short analysis today. But tomorrow on the analysis, I need to start getting into my three levels of statistics or information. Health of the system statistics like SAR, telling me how busy things are, how many I.O. operations or how many things are trying to use that resource, and then get into the time domain, quality of service statistics, uh, time to solution, and then the third level being my profiling. So when I'm doing an analysis, I've got three levels I'm going to try to reinforce to you. Health of the system, quality of service, profiling. When I'm health of the system, I'm looking for how busy things are. Quality of service, I'm looking for time to solution. And then profiling, I'm looking for non-productive resource consumption, crashing. When I'm looking at a system, there are two main uh, things that I'm looking for, contention between processes and thrashing being non-productive resource consumption, like thrashing to swap or something of that sort. Besides analysis, I want to get into performance evaluation, and that means getting into PC, getting into PBS and getting into accounting data. So PBS will tell me how long it's taking for these jobs to run. Another thing that we need to get into tomorrow is workload analysis. The more I know my workload characteristics, the more responsible my configuration decisions are. 
people always, you know, get tuning advice, and then the tuners will say, your mileage may vary, or that depends. That primarily depends upon your workload characteristics and what your workload needs to successfully run. So I'm going to be giving you nine codes, codes one through code nine, and I want you to characterize them and figure out which one is CPU intensive, which one is memory intensive, which one is IO intensive, which one is MPI, which one is OpenMP, which one uses shared memory or Shemem type of stuff. Each of the nine codes is something different, a different bottleneck, a different resource required for that application. So we're going to go into uh, SAR and accounting tomorrow in more detail. I also want to get into the monitoring tools and start going through the individual statistics. In particular, a very important file for you to understand is PROC MEM INFO to show me how memory is being used. Also in monitoring tools, I want to get into top. I want to get into PM chart and start looking at load problems on the system. Every morning, I'm going to start off with some sort of quick drill to figure out what's going on with the system. So Wednesday, I want to start off again with a review and see what shape my systems are in. How busy is CPUs? How busy is memory? How busy are disks? And then at some point on Wednesday, I want to move from health of the system and quality of service into profile and start getting into application tuning. And we're going to talk about single CPU application tuning first. Talk about things like cache misses, stride misses, stride patterns walking through memory. We also want to start profiling the application and getting down to a line number in the program where it's spending all of its time. And also in application tuning, start talking about hardware counters and getting to the performance counters for Linux the PAPI, Perfex, PCL type of counters that can tell me about uh, cache misses, uh, TLB misses. We need to talk about TLBs or translation look-aside buffers and various other hardware events that are available through the uh, performance counter for Linux PCL interface. In application tuning, I need to talk about the perf command that comes from Linux and also I am using the National Center for Supercomputer Applications, NCSA, from Champaign, University of Illinois, Champaign, Illinois, about the perf suite package from NCSA, and in particular PS Run and PS Process, and then get into hardware counter events down to the native processor hardware counters. So I want to be able to get the line number in my program that I'm taking TLB misses from or the line number in my program that I'm doing all my floating point operations from, things of that sort. Then moving into Thursday, Thursday's primarily getting into multi-threading, talking about OpenMP and MPI. And then we got to move that into a CPU set, D-place environment. So by uh, the middle of Thursday, I want to have jobs running under PBS Pro and PBS Pro creating CPU sets for each job I submit. And I want to look at the job while it's running and make sure that it has affinity to the CPUs, that it's pinning things down, and that its memory is on the node that it's running on. Lastly, and frankly, I run out of time quite a bit, but I want to talk about the application memory piece as well. Getting into uh, TLB misses, talking about uh, talking about uh, the memory map, being able to figure out where all my memory went, looking at the segments to a process, the shared text, which is the executable, the data segment, where my data and heap is, and the stack segment, where my subroutine calling information is found. And that's basically the whole plan here. We'll see what time we finish up on Friday, depending on how things go during the week. So Wednesday then is single CPU. Thursday then is multi-CPU. And Friday is kind of a wrap-up or a summary.
That's the basic layout. I do not always go through every chapter hard copy that you have in the workbook. There are a couple that we'll skip over, like the baseline I typically skip over. So, to begin with, people talk about what is tuning. I used to call this a tuning class, but I really don't like that term anymore. There's so many different aspects to tuning, and then people were coming in expecting uh, application tuning, for example. This class is for system administrators, not application programmers. The rule in this class is we cannot change source code. I can, however, use compiler options and things like that to get the best performance that I can. The code optimization, uh, we do have a HPC optimization and tuning class that's available out there. Uh, Gabby Corrin is actually the one that would be delivering it to your part of the world. And that is meant for application programmers to get into uh, stride issues, loop nest optimization, vectorization of the code, uh, things of that sort. All we're going to do is figure out what my codes are doing, how much CPU, how much memory, how much I.O., and characterizing the codes. We will use compiler options, but we're not going to actually go in and change do loops or anything like that. Secondly, system use optimization, trying to make sure that I am efficiently using my resources. So I could have a system that is 100% busy and getting no work done. I could have another system that is only 5% busy and getting a lot of work done. Just because CPUs are busy doesn't mean that's productive CPU time. I'm going to lock up the CPUs this week and basically stick multi-threaded applications on barriers, and their system time and user time might be up there at 100%, but I'm not getting any work done. So when I'm looking at a system, I'm primarily looking at health of the system statistics to see how much my resources are being used, and then the resources that are being used heavy, I'm going to go in and look and profile them to figure out if that resource consumption is productive and useful or non-productive and thrashing types of events. Uh, one of the programs I'm going to give you, Code 2. Bottom line, I want Code 2 to be shortest repeatable wall clock time by the end of the week. Uh, longest I've gotten Code 2 was several weeks. The shortest I've got it to on, a, on the UVs I'm using here is about nine seconds. So anywhere from nine seconds to a week for the same calculation. So I want to profile that thing and find out if it is productive or if it's thrashing. Third thing about tuning is resource management. When a resource is fully used, somebody's got to figure out who gets it. CPU schedulers. The memory manager is something called K-Swap-D. I get into the K-Swap-D tuning in the second week in the advanced sysadmin class. We will touch upon it this week, but we get into it in detail in the advanced sysadmin class. Another resource management daemon, for example, is the uh, flush daemon that's taking data that the program has written and is moving it from kernel memory and page cache off to the file system and off the disk. So we have different resource managers or schedulers that manage the resources. And we get into political scheduling. Political scheduling really falls into a multi-user uh, batch type of environment. For example, a university site where you have different departments or divisions. They're trying to share the same machine. When you get into political scheduling, you often are talking about a batch interface such as PBS, Torque, Moab, uh, LSF, something like that, to manage the politics of who gets to run on the system. Not everything can be done by software, so you also get into site policies. It's not uncommon for sites to have file system policies to say, for example, don't use temp or var temp. Those are often on root and could impact root's uh, file system space, fill up root, or create contention on root. 
Other examples of site policies might include whether you can log in or not. Interactive logins are often turned off on compute servers. Why we're in a distributed environment, why waste cycles and interrupts just to do character painting? Other site policies can include uh, file system usage and disk quotas, whether home directory is going to be used for scratch I.O. or things of that sort. Oftentimes when you log in, the site policies are going to be in the message of the day or there's going to be some sort of web page that describes the politics and how different things are going to be used. Also, part of tuning is sizing or matching the workload, system size, and the geometries. In fact, I was at a site last week looking at it. They had one job that had asked for a certain number of CPUs, but had not asked for enough memory, and it was thrashing on memory and swapping within that CPU set. It was kind of in bad shape. <laughs> it was an I.O. bound application that was filling up its CPU set with dirty data, then writing it out. Then the, the CPU set would be come, come all full with dirty data. Then that would go clean as it flushed it, and then it would throw away everything that it just read in as it grew. And then it started swapping and trimming. And then it had to reread everything that it had read into memory before. It was thrashing on disk, trying to hold both the file and the memory data set within the uh, particular CPU set. That particular user just needed to declare more memory, grab more CPUs, even if they're not using the CPUs, because they needed the memory. So as a system administrator, when I'm looking at a system, one of the key things I'm thinking about is sizing. Sizing being, am I matching the workload and the system characteristics? For example, this application that I saw last week, the file system was designed for four megabyte I.O. request sizes, and it was doing four kbyte request sizes into that file system. That was very inefficient. It also had an improper sizing on its, besides its I.O. requests, on the memory that it requested as well. So sizing the key application first, uh, there is one application in particular I think of as an example, Nastran. Nastran is used in the auto industry for vibrational study, modal analysis of things like a car door. As the object that you're doing the standing wave or modal analysis on gets bigger, the number of standing waves that can get generated in the data set get bigger, and now you've got a bigger memory footprint for the application. Astran has two things on it that are key to sizing it. One is how much scratch memory the application can use. So Nastran is what's known as an autocore solver. As the data set gets bigger and bigger, it knows it can't fit it into memory, so it treats the array as a file and brings the file in in pieces. And there is an I.O. request size parameter on the command line for Nastran to say, how much scratch memory can I use? So if there's a lot of memory on the system, I can make that very big. But if I'm trying to share the system with other users, I might have to have it smaller so that other users can also use memory. Another parameter on the Nastran command line is the size of the I.O. requests. So that I can basically reduce the I.O. overhead with Nastran by giving me more scratch memory, which gives me a bigger memory footprint, and also being able to increase my I.O. request sizes to match how the file system was built so I can do more efficient I.O. So that's an example of sizing the application. Another sizing example might be number of threads wide you go. You might have an application that's not scale past eight threads wide. You go past eight threads and it spends more time communicating between the threads than getting work done. Now another thing might be to reconfigure the software to match the workload characteristics. Again, the more I know my workload characteristics, the more responsible my configuration decisions are. 
one of the key things that bothered me at the site last week was I had all systems built, very, very wide striping, designed for four megabyte I.O. requests, and most of their I.O. requests were under a meg. In fact, most of the I.O. requests were under 512K byte in size. So I didn't feel that their file system, when I was looking at it, was properly designed for the type of applications that they were running. Now, I would first prefer to fix the application and increase the I.O. request size there. However, 4 megabytes pretty large. I can't really talk about it right now, but there is a max DMA size, the maximum I.O. request size that can come to a device driver, and that was quite a bit smaller than 4 megabyte. So they were never actually getting to the stripe width of their file systems. However, it was a large file system. They had some, something like 16 paths to 90 LUNs. They had 98 plus 2 LUNs out there. And that's a large file system. And going through the work of redesigning that file system, dumping off all the data that's out there, the service interruption for a couple of days while you rebuild it, usually leaves sites living with a file system design problem for years before they bite the bullet and go through a rebuilding of the file systems. But that would be one example of file system was not properly designed for the nature of the I.O., and you go back in and redesign the file system. Again, striping and I.O. is more part of the advances admin class in the second week, but we will touch upon it this week. Thirdly, if my application is efficient in what the resources it's using and is productive, and the file systems and the system is configured for that type of workload, and I'm efficiently using all my resources, then the next thing we need to do is back off on the workload. I do not want more than one thing running on a CPU. I don't want any contention, including contention on the interconnect like NumaLink. One of the uh, tuning objectives you do have is to look at your interconnect traffic, where it's NumaLink or InfiniBand, and drop that traffic down. Just because I have a large global memory system with NumaLink doesn't mean I want to be pushing everything across the interconnect and abusing it. One of the key things with UV is to stay on socket, on node, on processor, on board, on blade, and not go off blade. If I'm going off blade, I'm going to take a penalty. And uh, if I've got multiple things sharing a blade, there's going to be contention between them. So backing off on the workload will reduce contention and also reduce thrashing. Also, it might be just a matter of adding more hardware, adding more memory, or uh, adding more disk farms. Also, part of tuning is really matching expectations to what the workload demands are. Frankly, nowadays these systems are so big, they're just throwing the problem at them and really not getting into tuning and trying to optimize the system. One of the things here is the bigger the system, the bigger mess I can make. The bigger the system is, the quicker it falls. The more CPUs I have, the higher the intensity of the problem I can create. The more CPUs I have, the higher the I.O. problem is, the quicker I can fill up a file system and create a mess. So the more I have, the more problems I can create quicker. If I'm going uh, 4,096 threads wide, that's going to be a whole different case than something that's four threads wide. And if I'm on a 4096 CPU system and they're all trying to do I.O. or going into the kernel, then you're going to have high system time for that. There are times where I might want to take my 4096 CPU slash 11 SP2 system and actually partition it down so that I don't have 4096 CPUs in the kernel at the same time creating contention on the kernel, for example, trying to do I.O. And in that case, you might be better off partitioning to decouple the kernels so that I don't have 4096 
threads all trying to do some system call at the same time, creating high system time. But that might be an example of expectations to what the demands are. Any questions right now? So, performance evaluation. When I get into looking at the system, and I'm going to repeat this every day, I want you by the end of the day to be able to run off six resources. I count them different ways, but basically, when I look at a system, I want to say, what are the CPUs busy? How busy are they? How many things are trying to use them? I look at CPU first, then memory, then disk. Those are hardware features. We're all used to looking at that. Top will give me CPU utilization. I can get into memory, and I can get into disk activity. Then we get into the software events. File system buffer cache, I'm going to break out. File system is my metadata. File system are inodes and directories. File system is getting to the metadata itself. It includes the journal activity and that sort. I do have one of my programs that is file system intensive. The other aspect of my I.O. is the buffer. Buffer is raw I.O. By raw I.O., I mean I'm going straight into slash dev. I am not looking at super blocks, inodes, or directories. I'm going into a raw flat space. For example, uh, dump, restore, file system defraggers all do raw I.O. The journal. The journal or the log is what's keeping track of inode directory changes for faster file system recovery in case of a service interruption. The journal is also raw I.O. In fact, this is one big difference I'm going to warn everyone here right now. XFS is limited to the amount of memory that it can use for its raw I.O. There's a mount option that specifies how many buffers XFS can use for in-memory journaling activity. It's fixed. With extended 3, extended 4, there is no limit to the raw I.O. It's possible for that buffered I.O. that I see there to be the journaling activity. I don't know what my systems look like right now. I fired off workloads over the weekend. But I have had cases where I've had 100 gig of my file system data in what's called the slab, and the other half of my memory was all buffered. In other words, I've had a case where I had 250 gig of file system and journaling activity in my system, all in memory. And another key thing here is if I try to shut down the system, all that file system and buffered journaling activity that's in memory has to be flushed to disk and made coherent. So this is what I'm going to stress all week. When I go through my drill, I want to look at CPU first. How busy are they? Memory, what kind of shape is it in? Again, I'm looking at health of the system. How healthy is that resource? And then disks. Then I'm going to look at file system, which is in the slab or metadata. Then the buffer, which is my raw I.O. And then lastly, the cache. And the cache is also referred to as page cache. And I need to talk about both read and write and the flush daemon. So I'm going to be pounding on the file system buffer cache. And in particular, there is a file called slash proc slash mem info that I'm going to be going into this week to look at my file system buffer cache data. Okay. After inter, uh, file system buffer cache, then is interprocess communication. Now, there are two ways to use interprocess communication. One is Deb Shemem, and the other one is through a system call known as IPCS. Those are two different ways. And on a UV, the Deb Shemem can become a problem in a memory leak. So we need to look at that sort of stuff. One of the key things on a UV is to stay on socket, on node, on the memory that's attached to the processor. 
if somebody else comes along, gets that particular processor and that blade, and then creates a file in slash dev shemem, that file could fill up all the memory on that blade. Then the process goes away, the job goes away, but if the user did not remove their dev shemem file, it remains on that blade. Then PBS comes along and assigns somebody else to that blade, and then I come along and get that blade, and now all my memory is gone because it was allocated to a, a dev shemem file by the prior user. And now I've got all my memory gone, and now I'm going to be going off blade and getting a increase in latency and a drop in bandwidth because of that. So you want to watch for your interprocess communication stuff, in particular things that are not being used, that are inactive or unattached. And those things come out as memory leaks. So CPU, memory, disk, all system buffer cache, IPC, and then look at your networks. Look at TCP, DNS, NFS, NIS. I do have all three. I have an NFS home directory here, things of that sort. And then lastly, you get into your miscellaneous stuff, whether you're talking of a graphics card, GPUs, PCI, or your interconnect, whether your interconnect is NumaLink, InfiniBand, uh, that sort of thing. You do want to reduce interconnect traffic. I don't want to have a 256 socket system. Each of those sockets has its own memory, and I don't want to be bouncing data around between socket to socket. If I write I.O., and I'm on socket 10, for example, and on socket 10 I say I'm going to write to the page cache, and then the kernel by default does a round-robin scheme and copies that page cache or copies the data from my user space in the heap and copies it to the page cache in a round-robin fashion, and maybe it's going to go from node 10 off to node 200. And so the kernel copies it from node 10 to node 200 in page cache. And then the kernel and the flush daemon comes along and says, okay, it's time to write this stuff to disk, and then it finds the PCI interface back on blade socket 10, and now I push my data from socket 10 off to blade socket 200, and then from socket 200 back to 10 where the PCI card is, and I've been shuffling data around on the system, increasing my interconnect traffic, and that would be bad. Now, one thing nice about SGI's XVM is that it is affinity aware. And in that example, if I had a PCI card that was on socket 200, I would not be bouncing it back to 10. I would find the closest HBA to do my I.O. out on. I would not just sort of do a round-robin scheme that would increase the interconnect traffic. One of the things that I do is plot or use Linkstat UV to look at my interconnect traffic and try to keep that down. Just because I can use it doesn't mean I want to abuse it. Pushing stuff across the interconnect is going to have a negative impact. So, I do want to show you something here, and I've got to make sure that I mail it to you. And I'm going to get this to you. I have uh, been working on a newer cheat sheet. I don't know if you can really read this very well. The fonts are kind of small. And I'll send this to you during break just to be sure that you've got it. And let me go back to the presentation here, and then we'll take a break. So I'm going to go through my six resources. I'm going to look at three things here. I'm going to look at the health of the system, which is basically how busy is it. Then I'm going to look at quality of service, which is a time domain. And then I'm going to look at profiling. 
the health of the system is things like SAR, PCP, quality of service is time domain like the time command, comprehensive system accounting, or PBS, and then profiling is where I'm actually trying to figure out what it's doing, for example, S-Trace or G-Pro, things of that sort. We're also going to be looking at profiling with hardware counters and profiling with the perf utility and profiling with PS Run. So once I've been through that analysis, then I've got to figure out what my tuning options are. I always try to say fix the application first. Do not detune the system for a bad application. If the application is doing 512-byte transfers, I'm not going to drop the file system down to a 512-byte request size. I'm going to try to get the application to do things at a minimum of 64K byte. When we're talking about friendly, well-formed I.O., 64K byte is kind of the common denominator for a friendly I.O. request size. Again, I might deal with file system layout. If I am I.O. bound, I need to take care of the file system before I can take care of anything else. I can't get my CPUs busy if everything is waiting on I.O. And in particular, I do have to worry about washing dirty data. If I write something off to disk, say I've got a 256-gig machine, and I write a 200-gig uh, file, half of my memory can go dirty. And if I was on a 32-terabyte machine and I had 16 terabyte of dirty data before I start flushing it, I'm in trouble. My file system will not be able to keep up. I do intend to basically load the system down with dirty data. In particular, I'm going to write to a slow file system like NFS and then get all my memory sucked up with dirty data that I can't use that memory on. So one of the key things that we do tune is the flush daemon and when it starts flushing dirty data. I don't want it to get too far ahead. I don't want to get too much dirty data. Again, the second week, the advanced sysadmin class gets into the uh, dirty ratio, dirty background ratio, and stuff like that in more detail. We'll touch upon it this week. Also part of the memory manager is case swap D and some sysdetail parameters there to control uh, trimming. Do I trim my cache? Do I swap processes? What happens when I run out of memory? What happens when I run out of swap? And we need to talk about the out-of-memory killer as well. Then you get into CPU scheduling. Basically, we try to turn off the CPU scheduler. We put things into a CPU set and then give affinity with the dplace command or om place so that I'm always on the same CPU and nobody else is on that CPU. It's private to me. And everything about these systems is being able to get the affinity. I need to talk about locality versus bandwidth. There are times that I need to tune for locality and low latency. For example, the database credit card market, lots of little I.O. operations. I'm going to want to tune for latency, low latency, and locality. If I'm in the video market and I can't keep that video file local, then I've got to worry about bandwidth. So we've got to talk about this. Round robin versus first touch. Sometimes you want first touch. Sometimes you want round robin or interleave. Now, when do you want which? Here's my rule of thumb. Here's my mindset. If I can hold my assets local, I want to tune for locality and affinity. So if I have a 32 gigabyte machine and my process is going to take up uh, 16 gig and the file that I read in is going to take in 16 gig and both my assets and my process can fit on that socket, on that node, then I want to tune for locality. If it doesn't fit, if I cannot hold my application and my assets on that node, if they don't fit, then I need to do a bandwidth type of interleave round robin type of placement. So that's the key question. If I can fit everything on socket, I want to be first touch. 
If I cannot keep it on socket, then I need some sort of round-robin, interleave, bandwidth type of scheme. So example, again, credit card transactions are going to be lots of little. I want to tune for affinity. Latency, low latency is critical there. Video market, large sequential I.O., there I'm going to tune for bandwidth. So keep that mindset in. Do my assets fit? If I can hold my assets local and have affinity, that is what's best. Anyway, from there, we then need to talk about networks. This is not a network tuning class. And lastly, getting into a batch schedule to manage my resources. So when I'm making tuning decisions, I have to make trade-offs. For example, file systems, price versus performance versus reliability. We ship our file systems RAID 5, but the RAID 5 might not be the best. RAID 5 might be good for a video market, but not good for a home file system. Uh, root disk, my root disk might be RAIDed with a RAID uh, 1 mirroring type of concept or reliability, but that is going to cost me in performance and cost me in price. I've lost half the disk space, and write performance to a mirrored disk is going to be degraded. I'm not going to get full write performance if I've done mirroring, and I made a trade-off there between reliability, serviceability, and the price performance. So, Here's where we are. I want to get through this today, about ready for a break here. But first of all, i got to figure out what I have for the system and get a hardware and software inventory. Now, we do have a tool from SGI called System Info Gather. But that's not always loaded. And I do a dash capital A, little d, dash N. And it's going to write this inventory file into the current working directory with a timestamp on it that I could then take a look at later. Now, I was on an XE SMC cluster last week, and Foundation and Performance Suite were not loaded, and that command was not there. And I want to be able to get the inventory information without having that command. Uh, by the way, the new System Info Gather also has a man page to it, and I want to show you some of the features on how to use it. I have seen it take over an hour to get its inventory on a big system, so we have to be careful of that. After I know what I got, then I get to establish my performance metrics. For class this week, my performance metric is code 2, shortest, repeatable, wall clock. And I want that to be like nine seconds repeatable. I don't want it at 14 seconds or 20 seconds. I want it at nine seconds. So establish your performance metrics, basically saying, how do I know that I'm getting the work done? How do I know that my users are happy with the quality of service that they're getting? If I'm a data center manager, it might be jobs per day. If I'm an end user, it might be time to solution, turnaround time, the time from when I submitted the work to when I got my answer back. If I'm a web server, it might be web hits per second, database server transactions per second. I've got to figure out what metrics do I collect to tell me that I'm getting work done. And CPU utilization is not a performance metric. I could be 100% busy and not get any work done. Once I know what I need to collect, then I need to collect it, instrumenting the system. So here we're talking about invoking a PM logger, SAR, uh, possibly ganglia. If you're interested, I had ganglia RPMs to put on the UVs. Some sites will use Nagios. Whatever it is that you need to collect statistics, including a batch system like PBS or Torque, or LSF that have accounting data to them. So I need to be able to get the instrumentation going so that I can 
basically prove that my system is being used productively and be able to plan on upgrades and be proactive about resource consumption trends. So that's what today's topic is, those first three points. I'm also going to start getting into monitoring the system and getting into the workload. So during the week, we are going to have different types of performance events that I'm going to create. I'm going to start off every morning with an analysis on the system and figure out what workload is running. And tomorrow, we need to get into re characterizing the resource requirements. So again, I'm going to give you codes 1 through code 9. I want you to figure out what those nine programs are. So if I were on site, I was on a site last week, went to their PBS accounting data, found their top three users, their top five applications, and then started understanding what those five applications were. One was Gaussian, one was NASTRAN, that sort of thing. And then figure out how much CPU, how much memory, how much I.O. are they doing. The next step, which I could not exactly do last week, was to get a long-term baseline. One of the things I was interested at the site was how much dirty memory they had. When I talk about long-term baseline, I'm not talking about a half hour. I'm talking about a month worth of data. So I would have liked to have been able to look at a month's worth of data at the site. But when I was there, we turned on uh, PCP to collect a month's worth of PCP data. And then I can go in and look to see how much memory utilization I had how big the kernel got, how big the dirty data got, things like that. People are always asking, what's a good number, what's a bad number? The baseline is what gives me what range is that number in. Another example might be context switches. We need to talk about context switches, but that's basically disconnecting a process from a processor, taking it off the core, saving its program counter in internal registers known as the state or the context, and then connecting a new process to that core. That's a context switch. Do you know where your context switches typically are? So from that long-term baseline, I can say, oh, my context switches are typically about 2,000 a second. And then when I have any performance event or some sort of problem occurring, I then have a reference to say, oh, my context switches are in the 10 million right now. I'm in a storm right now. So I need the baseline to figure out whether I am in a normal behavioral problem situation or a behavioral problem. From that baseline and from the workload, I then choose an interval and start drilling into it. We're going to do that numerous times this week. And from there, then determine your problem and establish your tuning objectives. So when I've got my problem identified, then I have to sort out the different solutions to the problem. I would like to optimize the application first. If the application is thrashing on TLBs, if I have a stride pattern that is not efficiently using cash, if I do not have a stride one pattern, also referred to as rows versus columns, I want to deal with that first. I got one program that I can go from 40 seconds to 25 seconds just by flipping the stride, what's known as rows versus columns, stride one pattern. Fix those things first. If I can cut the CPU time of my program in half, just by flipping how I stride through the array, no matter what I do on the system side, fixing the application got me the payoff. Very easy for a programmer to write a program that can abuse the system and be non-productive in resource consumption. Secondly, as a system administrator, once I understand my workload characteristics, then I want to make sure that my system is configured for that. This includes file system layout, to CTL parameters, things of that sort. Thirdly, when I know the application is efficient and optimally using its resources, that all the memory is using is productive memory use, that the I.O. is optimized for the uh, best I.O. request size for the file system, then I know that I'm efficiently using my resources, 
and that the resource consumption is not out of control, that I'm properly managing those resources, such as uh, memory management, then I want to back off on the workload. I do not want swapping. I do not want to run out of memory. I especially do not want to run out of swap. If I run out of swap, I can hit an out-of-memory killer situation that would be severe. Fourthly, then, offload workloads to a different system. If I have a database server going to web server, I will probably split those systems off so that network traffic hitting the web server is not going to impact the database server. A lot of things nowadays, these systems are not necessarily a general purpose computer. The more things they try to run in diversity, the more potential bottleneck problems you have. The best running systems will have just two or three things running, and then you can optimize. Again, it's not necessarily a general purpose computer, but it's been optimized for a particular type of workload. Then I might have to reset customer expectations, things like thread width. I may have an application that does not scale well. They're sitting there trying to go 128 threads wide, but once it goes past eight threads wide, it gets stuck on multi-threaded problems we need to talk about this week, like barrier synchronization and cache thrash due to false cache sharing. Again, the bigger the system is, the bigger a mess I can make. I can take my program that might be at nine seconds single-threaded and put it into the hours for the same calculation if I do things wrong. It's easy for a programmer to do things wrong and create a mess. I'll give a variety of examples when we get into that later. Also, at that point, I might be looking at adding or upgrading the hardware, adding more memory, things of that sort. And also sites, for example, in file system design may live with the abuse and the impact on the system. There are a variety of uh, references listed in the workbook here. Docs.sgi.com, the biggest one is really this uh, x86 Linux application tuning guide. And that's the one that closely matches what this workbook and this class are about. Also, I'm going to be using Performance Copilot, and it has its own website here on the open source software SGI.com site. In fact, I have PCP loaded on my Windows laptop to be able to look at my Linux systems. So that's the key one from SGI. Novell has one. There is a system analysis and tuning guide from Novell. And I've got two manuals from uh, IBM. And then lastly, two other manuals. If I were to go buy two books, these would be the two books I would be interested in buying. Optimizing Linux Performance is the closest book to what this class is covering. However, none of these really get into the methodology. None of them get into the interpretation of the data that the tools are giving me. They'll tell you about the tools and the columns and the metrics, but not how to use the data and how to read the data. And that's what I'm trying to focus on this week is how to interpret the data that I'm seeing. And that's kind of hard to do in a dedicated standalone lab. That works better as a group. That's why the group demos are more important this week than the individual labs. The rest of these books I would not bother with. They're just prior bibliography. But if I were to buy a book, I'd start with optimizing Linux performance, and then I'd uh, have access to the Linux or the SLES manual, and then the SGI x86 tuning guide. And that's it. Let's see. I've got 10 minutes to the hour. 